I'm joined by Simon Jenkins, author and journalist. He now writes for the Guardian newspaper. Simon, thanks for speaking to RT. Now, you've written extensively criticising the way the intervention in Libya has been handled. What was wrong with it? Was it wrong to begin with, or did it veer off course during the process? Yes, I don't think there's anything wrong with the way it was handled. Uh, I, I just didn't think it should have taken place in the first place. Um, I do not believe that sovereign states have uh, a legal right or an obligation or a duty to interfere in other sovereign states. It's written into the United Nations Charter. Um, this was not a country that threatened Britain. It didn't threaten any, any of its neighbours. It hadn't invaded a neighbour. It was going about its own business, which is that of revolution. It was its own business. So do you think the original justification, preventing a massacre in Benghazi, was that not entirely true then? I'm sure nasty things would have happened in Benghazi. Nasty things happen all over the world. Um, the excuse that there might have been something nasty about to happen as a justification for invading, for totally invading a country and bombing its capital, is, I find, quite extraordinary. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a novel concept in international affairs. Clearly, there were other interests in play in Libya. There was oil. Um, it was uh, close to the Mediterranean. Um, they were lighter-skinned people. I mean, all the kind of things you get lying behind British foreign policy applied here. Um, there was no justification for it, except the theory that there would have been a massacre had we not gone in in Benghazi. Those ulterior motives, things like the lucrative oil contracts that are now being fought over, do you think they were more important then than, say, preventing loss of human life? Well, I mean, if we're, if we're going to go in wherever there's a possible loss of human life, we're going to go invading countries all over the world all the time. Um, I'm assuming, uh, more, more than assuming, I think I know, there are mixed motives in all these interventions. Um, we tend to intervene in countries where we think we might win, which is not a totally moral attitude. Um, we tend to intervene in countries where we have some interest, in this case oil. Uh, we tend to intervene where we think, I think, there's... Uh, almost quick glory to be had, as was the case, I think, in Iraq, and uh, clearly was the case here. They're always mixed motives, but I think we always need to examine our motives um, and ask ourselves a simple question, are we going to do good rather than harm? In this case, it seems we've done good, um, but th that was by no means guaranteed. The fact of the matter was, it was not our country. Do you think it's gone to plan, then? This, clearly, they thought they were going to get quick glory. It did last a bit longer than they thought, but it's not over yet, is it? Well, I mean, they came close to panicking. I mean, it, it, they thought bombers could do the trick. Bombers can never do the trick. They said they would do the trick in Baghdad. They didn't. They said do the trick in Belgrade. They didn't. Um, uh, bombers never do the trick. Um, after a few months of it clearly not working, uh, they decided to put in ground, what is effectively ground troops. Uh, and, and special forces went in all over the place. Um, they did what I think probably they should have done at the very beginning, which is say that we want this one over quickly. Uh, it'll be over quickly if we go in with ground troops, as was the case in Kosovo. Um, and eventually, after six months, they did indeed win. Um, there's no good pretending this was done by the Libyans. This was done by Western forces. Britain's role in this, as you just mentioned, they had special forces on the ground. Will we ever know the full extent of that? Because it wasn't even legitimate in the first place, was it? Well, I mean, we wrote the UN resolutions concerned. I mean, we, we, this is entirely our doing. I mean, we, we, you know, we decided to do it, then we found reasons for doing it. Uh, we decided there was going to be a massacre in Benghazi. We decided we needed a UN resolution written in a certain way. We claimed to be going in to protect civilians. Well, we ended up bombing them. Um, I mean, all the things that were done were done with the intention of justifying a, a British-French invasion of, of, of Libya. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that we'll know much more over time because all these special forces will start writing their memoirs, as they always do. The mission creep we're seeing here, was it planned, do you think, or is it just an inevitable, unavoidable consequence of intervention? I think it's a very difficult question, mission creep. Um, invariably, when it happens, and the great case was in, was in, was in Bosnia, um, people say at the beginning, we won't, we won't let this happen. We are only going in to aid humanitarian relief or whatever it might be. In this case, we were only going in to save the citizens of Benghazi from what was claimed to be a huge massacre. You know, it would have been a pretty unpleasant thing, there's no question about that. Um, uh, but at the back of everyone's mind, which is why the army was so reluctant to fight Libya, is the knowledge that mission creep always happens. Um, you cannot control the situation on the ground. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, you've got to be prepared for the worst, um, because the worst is what usually happens. Now, in this case, it was looking a real mess until the very end. At the very end, we've got special forces surrounding Tripoli. Um, they didn't just get lucky. I mean, they, they used main force. They were using helicopters. Um, they were you know, using British weapons to bash through walls and everything. Um, in the end, we did what we probably should have done at the beginning, which was make sure we were not going to lose. 
When David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy visited Tripoli recently, they were given a hero's welcome. People cheering, chanting their names, wanting to shake their hands. Do you think that was awkward for them, or was it something that they wanted and expected? I think it was just totally ill-judged. I mean, it was clearly a triumphal visit. Um, it's very soon to have a triumphal visit when the enemy's still alive. Um, you, you can't pretend it wasn't triumphal. It was triumphal. These were, these were two battered prime ministers going to a foreign country where they knew they were going to get cheered. Uh, I thought it was unnecessary and tasteless and, of course, uh, weakens the authority of the, of the domestic government, who at this particular juncture should have um, at least been allowed to present themselves as being the victors. It was abundantly clear this was a British-French victory, and that's what the visit was designed to signify. And what does that mean now? Does that give them a responsibility that they might not be able to meet? I think it does. I think the British and the French now have a very strong responsibility to make absolutely sure this does not fail. That may well mean sending in troops. Um, when you invade a country, uh, you, uh, you can't then say, oh, we've done our job, we're going to go, um, because people look to you to continue the revolution that you started or you, you, you aided. Um, I just don't see how we can abandon Libya if, if, as is at least possible, possibly even probable, anarchy breaks out. What about Gaddafi? David Cameron seems to be washing his hands of that issue, saying his fate is in the hands of the NTC. Is that shirking responsibility? I'm assuming that British and French forces are now trying to f find Gaddafi in Serti. I mean, I, I can't see the point of not finishing the job. Um, you know, we, we, we claim just to establish a no-fly zone. Well, that was a joke. Um, I, I just, it just seems to me that if you're going to attack a country in this way, you must at least finish it, and then you own the country. And the really difficult thing is to transfer power from yourself as the uh, powerful authority uh, to the local people. And I think they're going to find that very difficult. What sort of message does this send out, that they're now kind of controlling this in this kind of neo-colonial way? Well, the message it sends out is, provided you make enough stink uh, in a country, then Britain and France might come along and help your revolution. Um, that happened in Kosovo after Bosnia. It was abundantly clear what happened there. And a bunch of gangsters who were running Kosovo effectively said, you know, we're being massacred by the Serbs, which is certainly true. Come and save us. We went in and saved them and had to create a new country. I mean, we partitioned Yugoslavia. Um, I mean, the message is uh, the West is uh, effectively a mercenary army for any uh, rebel group that cares to make enough of a stink about it. And I just think that's dangerous to world peace. How different is this really from Iraq, Afghanistan and previous interventions? I mean, they say they've learnt their lessons. Have they? Well, I mean, the, the only lesson I draw from any of these is don't do it. Um, they haven't learned that lesson. Uh, they're, they're clearly going to start looking for another one. I mean, I imagine there's going to be some trouble in, in Syria. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with it. I mean, Iran is a, you, you do not invade in Iran unless you're out of your mind. Um, it's a huge country. Um, Iraq was a pretty big country, and we found that very difficult. Um, Afghanistan at least is small, but we're getting a bloody nose there. Um, I mean, I guess the lesson of Libya is if it's a really small country, you might get away with it. NATO are applauding themselves as this is the, the model of a successful intervention. Why is this not happening in Syria and Yemen and places like that then? I think the reason is that they thought this would be a good idea and it worked. Um, uh, it was easy to do. You could run it from a few um, aircraft carriers and bases in the Mediterranean. So it was a doable um, enterprise. Um, you could put in special forces quite easily without too many people noticing. Um, I just think it, was, it, it, it came along at the time. I always couldn't realize why they didn't do Burma when the, uh, the famine was on. And that was a very good example of where you could have intervened. And you, had, you had total forces available. And they just didn't have the nerve to do it on that occasion. Um, I mean, I think these things are completely random now. It's difficult to, 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 to see how you orchestrate a, a foreign policy based upon these random interventions. As for NATO, I mean, what is it to do with NATO? NATO is a North Atlantic alliance against the Russians. It's, it is, I repeat, it's, it's like kind of a mercenary force roaming the world looking for things to do. It's completely stuck in Afghanistan. It may yet get stuck in Libya. Can intervention work, though, the principle of it? It works if it works. I mean, it, it toppled Saddam Hussein. Um, it punished the Taliban. It toppled Gaddafi. It works. How should this have been handled? How should Libya have been handled, do you think? I just have left it alone. We've left Syria alone. We've left Bahrain alone. We've left Yemen alone. Why Libya? Is this not turning your back on oppressive regimes killing civilians? Well, I, why, are you why is your back there in the first place? I, mean, what, what, why, what, I don't understand the argument. I mean, are we turning our back on Somalia? 
I don't know. I mean, are we turning our back on? Did we turn our back on Congo? I mean, Congo and Somalia are far worse than Libya. No one's going, you know, screaming, why aren't we attacking Congo and, and Somalia? I'm afraid it's because they're black. And I think people say that. I mean, these, are very, these are very racial, biased operations. And for some reason, we've got it in for Muslim countries at the moment. And this is the third one we've invaded. Um, possibly the fourth, you could argue, Kosovo. And uh, the message it gives out to the world is that the, the West is highly biased, it's loaded, it's interested in oil. Um, it'll help you if, you're, um, if you look as if uh, you're in with a chance. It won't if you're not. Um, and as for the rest of Africa, it can go hang. What does this mean now for the Arab Spring? Does this intervention reinforce it or undermine it? I don't know what it means for Arab... Uh, what is the Arab Spring? I mean, the Arab Spring was, was, was a, a number of rebellions, most of which were suppressed. Um, two, now three of which have got away. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in Egypt yet. Um, we don't know what spring means. Um, it could well be that, that Morocco and Bahrain are better off through not having toppled their governments, but having forced the government to reform than the ones that did topple the government. I just don't know. All I know is it's not my responsibility. There is no British Empire anymore. Um, you know, we are not um, charged by the electorate or by the world to go around invading other people's countries because we don't like their regimes. It's just not our job. Simon Jenkins, thank you.